How's it going, Kevin McFarlane? Good to see you on here, bud. We'll let a few people jump on here real quick. I'll get fired up here. I don't want to keep you guys too late tonight. Good. I'm glad to hear that, Kevin. Scuba Steve. Looks like you've been out turning some soil, bud. Jason, Austin, good to see you on here. Well, we got a few of you jumped on here. I'll tell you what, I'm just going to go ahead and start off with this right now and get it going. Uh, <clears throat> you know, with me doing all the customer service work, I get questions, phone calls, emails all the time. And right now, as you all well know, we're in the planting season for the spring. So my phone is literally blowing up, ringing off the hook. So this, this last couple of weeks, I've been taking down some questions, some notes of what people have been asking me. And I thought I'd kind of share them on here and and after going through all the notes the other day, I realized, you know, a good topic would be the seven easy ways of planning, because 90 percent of the questions I get are are anything from the pH to plant uh, seed depth to call a pack or not to call the pack, you know, drag it, all kinds of different things. So I thought I'd kind of go on here and just kind of explain some about that. But uh, one thing I've been noticing a lot with people here lately, they have been asking me what my position actually is with the company. And, uh, you know, I did sales for a while. Uh, I'm no salesman, guys. I'm, I'm just not. You know, I'm the project specialist for the company. I take care of all the shows. Uh, I work with our marketing group, uh, work with our TV celebrities or personalities, stuff like that. But my job really is, is to help all you guys out there uh, with all your food plot and, and deer nutritional needs. I mean, I look at it that I'm the guy that you're going to come to uh, ask the questions and I'm going to tell you what I think is going to work the best. I'm not going to try to sell you on a product. Um, I'm here just to offer my advice and help you guys in any way I can. So, uh, that's really me. You know, that's how I am. That's why I like, and I enjoy doing these things here. Uh, anybody out here has questions, even though I'm talking about these seven easy steps, throw the questions on there and I'll answer them. I also, I got some pro staffers on there too. I know they answer some of them. Uh, I might touch on them a little bit too, but uh, answer away, throw the questions out there and, uh, we'll answer them as best as we can. And, uh, we'll get going from there, but you know, when it comes the first step, the plant and the food plot, there is a lot of people look at things different ways. You know, for me, I'm going out there and I'm going to test my soil. That is the number one step that you need to do. And that is the number one step that most people don't do. And it's the cheapest step actually to do. Uh, so it doesn't make sense. You know, you need to check that soil. You need to test that pH. And that pH is actually is going to be the key ingredient right there, that pH level of letting them plants utilize the fertilizer you put down. So that's the reason you want to plant, uh, you want to test that pH. We have test kits. You can take them to co-ops. Uh, you know, you can go buy a probe, whatever you want to use, just test that pH and it's going to help you out in the long run. It's going to help them plots out. The forage is going to be a lot better. The plants are going to be a lot sweeter. The deer are going to benefit from them a lot more. So testing that pH again is the number one step uh, before doing anything to your soil. I mean, you want to do that before you before you work the soil, anything, do it. I do mine early in the spring. I actually, this year when I dug mine up, it was halfway frozen. So I had to let it thaw out after I got it in my bucket. But uh, make sure you test that soil. It has to be tested and uh, to get the best out of them plants. But after after testing that soil, what I like what I like going through with is, is like a, 
you want to get into that plot, you want to eliminate all weeds. You want to condition that soil. So what I'm what I'm going in there doing is I'm going to go in and I want to take, I use glyphosate, 41% glyphosate, just a generic roundup. I'm killing my plots off. I do not like using 2,4-D mixed in with anything just because residual there. I mean, it, it takes about 30 days before you can actually plant over 2,4-D. So you want to go in there with like a glyphosate type product, roundup, generic roundup, uh, go in there, kill that area off. Now with me, I'm using our soil conditioner, which is called Plot Max. I think everybody should use it. You're definitely going to benefit from it. Uh, that one 32 ounce bottle is actually going to treat uh, a half acre plot. You can mix that Plot Max right in with your glyphosate, your your wheat, your herbicide. So you're actually doing a one pass. You're actually conditioning the soil with the Plot Max. You're killing the plot off with the, the herbicides that you choose to use. So conditioning that soil, you know, anything that can help that soil to break down that soil like the Plot Max does, that will allow them plants to utilize the nutrition, uh, the, the nutrients that are there. I mean, it's it's a definite benefit. So again, mix that Plot Max right in with your herbicides and, and spray those in one pass. So it'll work out good for you. Now, <clears throat> A lot of people ask me, how do you how do you add lime? And that kind of goes in with the, the soil testing process. When you go to add lime, you know, you're looking at two different ways. You're looking at like with our test kit, our test kit is actually going to show you the amount of ag lime that you need to use to add to that plot to get it up to the desired rate that you want. But ag lime and, and which I use pelleted lime. Pelleted lime, you only need one tenth of what ag lime calls for. So um, I like the pelleted lime. It's not as messy. It's it's easy to go to your store and pick it up. Yes, fertilizer, lime, everything's going sky high right now. Excuse me, I noticed I went to get some lime here the other day and they have a 10 bag limit on lime. Uh, but if you can't get into that spot with, with a piece of equipment such as the fertilizer plant lets you have rent a buggy or let's use a buggy, whatever. If you can't get on your property, use that ag lime. I highly recommend using pelleted lime. Pelleted lime is going to break down faster, but it doesn't last as long as the ag lime. So you want to get that done as soon as possible. I'm, I'm putting mine on when the, when the ground's frozen, getting ready to start thawing out, right? When I'm getting ready to start frost seeding. And because uh, you're looking at a a, with pelleted lime, you're looking about three months for it to break down. With ag lime, you're looking about six months. So you want to get that on there as soon as you can, especially if you guys are only planting fall plots. Get it on there early in the, you know, in the spring to early summer. Let that stuff start breaking down so it'll be ready to go. So, Corey, mate, good to see you on there, bud. I got a lot of guys on here. I, I appreciate it. And... Uh, Got one guy in here. He said he needs some clover fuel before too long. Yeah, I've been spraying the heck out of clover fuel here lately. Would it be okay to mix the trophy clover and honey hole for a plot? I don't recommend it. Uh, you definitely can. Uh, what you have there is you got a high protein food source with the trophy clover, which is great. You got a high energy food source with the honey hole, which is great. But that honey hole gets so big and thick. What I have noticed over the years in testing products that that honey hole will get so big, the leaves get so big, it'll shade out that clover and it'll stun it and it just stay there kind of a dormant stage or it could kill it off. So if I'm doing anything like that in a plot, I'm planting them side by side. So <coughs> now, you know, we talked about adding lime. You know, that's, that's a pretty easy thing to do, pretty inexpensive thing to do. Uh, Next thing we're looking at, fertilizer. You know, when it comes to fertilizer, the first thing you want to look at is think about what you're going to plant because that's going to determine the type of fertilizer you need. With your with your perennial type plots, such as your clovers, your your alfalfa, uh, stuff like that, you don't and, the, and your peas, you don't need to add nitrogen to them plots. Now, them plots there, just like with the clovers, it's going to draw in the nitrogen through the air stored into the soil, uh, which is something we're going to talk about here shortly. But so you want to stay away from the nitrogen. If you have to get nitrogen, you'll see like on our bag, we're showing like 
uh, a 51530, which is hard to find anymore. I mean, all this fertilizer is hard to find right now, but uh, I'm a 0060 guy. If I can find 0060 or 02020, that's what I'm going with on uh, my clover plots, my alfalfa plots, my peas, stuff like that. And it works the best. Now you get into them annual mixes, say you're going to plant honey hole like he was talking about here. You know, you're going to get in there that you're wanting to plant. Uh, you're, you got a plant there that loves nitrogen. So you're going to want a higher nitrogen, something like a triple 19. Uh, again, hard to find here in my area. You cannot find triple 19 anywhere. So you're dropping down to triple 13, uh, triple 12. Sometimes you can find a triple 15. Uh, with that, we're going to have the recommended rate on uh, the poundage of fertilizer to use per acre on our bags. You get from it and they're like, let's just say the honey hole 300 pounds per three uh, for per acre of triple 19. Uh, you know, if you're dropping down to a triple 10, something like that, you're going to, you're going to increase that. If you ever have any questions, feel free to yell at me and I'll talk to you about it. Anthony coach, you're good to see you here, bud. Uh, but yeah, you always want to plan on what you're going to plant before you put any fertilizer down on that plot. So figure out what you're going to plant get a game plan there, then go to your, your fertilizer. Now with the fertilizer, I recommend tilling my fertilizer in. So I'm putting my fertilizer down, especially on a new plot, uh, on the day that I'm tilling, I want to work that in, especially for these annual plots that you're using something with nitrogen because nitrogen will evaporate. So working that into that soil, uh, it's containing that nitrogen. It's not letting it escape as well as just sitting out on top of the soil. And uh, so I will, I'll always try my best to be able to work that in if I can. If not, I'm going to try to get it in prior to a rain. Uh, and anybody out there, and this is getting ahead, of, uh, getting ahead there, but anybody out there that's actually going in and, and fertilizing an annual plot with, with nitrogen or urea, you know, urea or a nitrogen based type fertilizer, uh, you know, make sure you're getting the rain. Don't get in there and burn it because you can burn them plants up. So, Brandon Roberts, good to see you on here, bud. That's all right. You're late. I'll, I'll, I'll let you pass this time, bud. But yeah, work that work that fertilizer in if you can. Uh, till it in, disc it in, anything like that works out really, really well. Uh, and you don't got to worry about evaporation from the the, uh, the nitrogen. So after the tilling, you're looking at seeding your plot. For many, many years, all most people's ever heard of is we're going to go in there and we're going to till the plot. We're going to throw the seed down. And we're going to drag it with a bed spring or chain link fence or, or a harrow or anything like that. And uh, that's true on some products. You can get by with it. We've done it for years, but I'll tell you what, any more... And I know a lot of people don't have the extra funds to get it or whatever, but go out there and get you either a roller, a cola packer. You know, people always hear me talk about the packer max that I use. That that thing there is just, you know, guys always ask, hey, you must be getting something out of this you're always talking about. I'm like, no, I talk about the products that I really care about and I really use and I benefit from. So that is one of them. You know, that is a that is a key piece of equipment that I use that makes my plots so much better than they ever were. So, but pick you up an old, old call the packer. If you find one in a farm sale, buy you a packer max, just a roller roller works, works. Okay. It's better than nothing. You know, packing that seed bed after you till or disc up and then seeding and packing again, you'll have a lot better success on germination than you will by trying to drag over it. Uh, a lot of times what people do, especially, you've heard me say it many times on here, there's guys out there, I mean, and tillers are getting to be a big thing. You know, everybody's using a tiller. They make a beautiful plot. But what I see with a tiller, a lot of guys are doing, they're wanting to turn it into their garden. And you don't need to do that with these plots. And, and in doing that, you actually hurt yourself because they go in and they till it and they make six or seven passes on it, turn it to powder. And then they're going to go in and they're going to drag over it and they're not going to pack it first. So they're going to go hand broadcast a seed. And then that eight inch deep seed bed they got there that's turned to powder. They're going to drive over top that seed and smash the tire tracks all the way down way too deep. And then that loose powder when they're dragging, it will actually drag way too much soil over the seed and you're going to lose germination. So, Using a tiller like that, 
it's fine to make it powder, but pack that soil. Get a cola packer, get a Packer Max, get a roller, tire track it in with your side by side, your tractor, track it all in, and then seed it and go over it again. You want a good, firm, hard seed bed prior to plant uh, prior uh, to planting these plots. So, with a disc, you can do the same thing with the disc. You can turn one to powder with a disc too if you run over uh, enough times and work it up. And depending on the soil, sandier soil especially, you can lose a lot of germination by pushing that seed way too deep. So. And again, with a tiller or a disc, if you're making a turn it to powder, it's real soft and fluffy. And you think, well, I'm just going to go ahead and seed over it and let it rain on it tonight. You know, you get a hard rain, it could actually push that seed too deep and you lose germination. So packing that soil to me is the main thing to do. I mean, I, for years, I never used one. I never used a call the packer. I never packed the soil. And the difference I see today than what I was 15 years ago is night and day difference. So. If you can find you something, best thing to do, get you, get your Packer Max, get you call the Packer, uh, something in that in that category there that you can actually pack that soil. Again, like I said, a roller works good too. And with and with a call the Packer, I mean, it helps bring that moisture to the surface. So it helps you in that germination rate. So, but yeah, packing that soil prior to seeding, packing it after seeding, uh, you're going to see a big difference in your forage and and the germination rate that that you gain so but <clears throat> that's pretty much it when it comes to the planting part you know pray to god mother nature treats you right you get the rain we all been there you know get a little bit of rain get a little bit of germination it looks like a little green carpet coming up and all of a sudden we don't have rain for three months and it's done for you know pray for <laughs> pray mother nature treats you right but doing them, them six steps right there is very critical to get it done right. Now, when it comes to the last step, what I call actually maintaining the plots. Maintaining, especially with me being a diehard clover guy, you know, you need to maintain them, them perennial plots and clover plots and chicory plots. Uh, you know, they got to be cut. They got to be mowed that, you know, when they mature out, you got to mow them. When, when you see clover flowering, that means it's at its lowest protein rate, least palatable for the deer to eat. So when you cut that plant, you take them tops off that plant, it, it turns it right back around to the highest protein rate and the most palatable for them deer to eat. So you definitely want to do that. It makes your plant healthier, your plot will be better, helps some weed control. If the weeds are way out of control, you know, you can use a product such as Clethodem on the grass control uh, 2 4 db on your uh, broadleaf control. So that's the maintenance I'm doing. Now, in my annual plots, there's maintenance there too. I will use, depending on the mix, you really got to look, see what the mix is. Let's just say our honey hole blend. Okay, I'm going in and that plant starts coming up, starts looking good. I start seeing some grasses in it. I'm spraying clethodim on it to kill the grasses. I don't put any kind of a broadleaf control on it. You do not want to do that. Uh, but the clethodim, I'm using on it. You just want to make sure that you do not spray it on anything that you want to keep in there that's in the in the grass seed family. So, because uh, it will kill it, uh, such as our nose sweat. A lot of people want to spray it on there for a broadleaf control. It it that that rye that's in it, it will kill that rye. So, you really want to watch out. But, but yeah, so the the maintenance part's my biggest thing. I hate weeds in a plot. I want my clover to look like a golf course, but you know, I've been told over and over and over and over for years that the deer eat weeds. They have three years, that's what they live on. But it still drives me nuts. So the, I just want a good looking plot that, that I'm proud of. So I'm always using herbicides now, same as fertilizer. It's going stupid crazy. <clears throat> crazy. Uh, all herbicides, all fertilizers, everything is. And one thing I did forget to mention about seeding your plot, let's get back to that because there's a couple of things I, I really need to talk about. And I just had a discussion with a gentleman today over it. The worst thing you ever do with a plot is overseed it with too much seed. You know, use a recommended rate or go light. So overseeding that plot, everybody thinks more is better. Absolutely not. So no overseeding on that plot with too much seed and plant depth. Okay. 
you heard me talk about the plant depth when it comes to using the call to packer or the packer max stuff like that that's going to set it pretty good and what you have here is you have different bright different varieties that the seeds are in different shapes sizes the whole nine yards so you never want to plant a seed deeper than three times its size so if you look at a clover a clover seed that's the size of a pencil lead i mean you don't go very far i would rather see them on top in that packed soil than i would down too far because you're going to lose germination so just think about that when you're seeding uh don't think you have to get down there now you know you're going to see a lot of ours uh on all of our bags we're going to tell you the seed depth the whole nine yards on our our internet page does our website uh you'll be able to see all that but yeah no more than three times the size of the seed and you'll be good to go so jason good to see you on here bud but uh but no yeah i just want to throw that back at you we kind of touch bases on the maintaining the maintaining you know to me it's not something that you have to do on certain plots but i'll tell you what if you're doing anything with clovers chicories alfalfas you have to maintain them plots if the deer aren't doing it for you if you got a small plot a lot of times them deer do it for you but the title tell sign is that flower so you start seeing that flower popping up in that and that beautiful looking little plot flowers everywhere that's the title tell sign that that plant has matured out and you got to cut it it's at its lowest protein rate and you want to get it turned back around and you want to get it growing it's going to make it healthier sweeter the whole nine yards so you definitely want to do that but let's see what kind of questions we got here guys kind of went through that pretty quick actually a bunch of them on here let's see what we got here got some guys need some clover fuel Oh, Corey's on here. Good to see you on here, bud. Michael's asking, when is a good time to plant barricade loaded, <clears throat> located in eastern Iowa? Well, here's what you look at with barricade. Barricade, you never want to plant it until that ground temp gets at least 60 degrees. Anytime after that, you're good to go. But it is a slow growing process. So the earlier you can, I mean, as soon as my ground temp's hitting 60 here in central Illinois, I'm planting it. You know, that's just how I do it because I want it growing up and get the best out of it. Uh, so you're using uh, urea before. You know, I use urea, but man, you really got to watch using it. Make sure you're getting plenty of moisture because you can burn the heck out of it. But man, if you can use it, and even with Barricade, our Jolt product, I sound like a salesman here and I'm not trying to be, but our jolt product, it will, it, it will give that a jolt. I mean, it will throw it up. So with my applications of jolt every year, I do about four applications of jolt on my barricade and I throw some Maria in and uh, my, you know, I'm getting 12, 14 foot of growth out of an eight foot plant. So it loves this nitrogen. See here, what about the guy that's only planting a couple half acre plots and only has an ATV to work with? Buddy, you're looking at the guy that any pictures of you seen of mine for many, many years has been planting with an old big red three wheeler. Got a homemade disc that I built that was five foot wide that went behind it. Uh, yeah, I got two tractors now. I got six foot discs, the whole nine yards. But as you can see with my pictures, that three wheeler is in every plot. That's just my baby. I love using them for them small plots. Uh, I just get a satisfaction out of it that I can't. I, I just words won't mention it. But uh, yeah, getting in there with a, a ATV with a small disc or even a Harrow. You know, I got plots that I don't even take a disc back to small plots that I just have a, a drag Harrow. And long as you can kill them weeds and grasses out of that plot and get them dead. That little hair will work that soil up like crazy. So backwoods, you're looking at like game changer clover for four years of growth in a shaded poor soil area, no sweat, you know, a good annual mix. Uh, again, for that, that poor soil shaded type area. But yeah, you can do a lot with an ATV 
on a food plot. Uh, I've done it for years, uh, 25 years, 26 years this year. You know, that big grid's been in every plot I've pretty much ever had. And uh, people laugh at me over it, but I'll tell you what, I'll leave the tractor at home and I'll take it just because it's just so much fun and get just, I like, I like the little things. I mean, you know, I enjoy doing it. So even in some of the bigger plots, I'll use the ATV just because I, I'm enjoying everything I do out there. Mow my clover with a four foot, uh, well, it's 46 inch actually, uh, pull behind finish mower that I put a lift kit on and jacked it up where the most seven inches high. You know, uh, I just sold a six foot finish mower out here for my tractor and went back, went to a five footer, you know, it's, uh, but I use that three wheeler mowing. So yeah, this ATV, you can do so much with one. Old Lincoln's on here. Lincoln's good to see you on here. I've been talking all about your Packer Max on here. Anybody on here, you see Lincoln Road on there. That's who you need to go see if you're looking for a Packer Max. And that's the guy that'll take care of you right there. Anything I need from the guy, he helps me out in any way I can. So great product, great customer service, and a dear friend. So but when you say ground temp, are you talking about the surface temp? So I like getting down there, you know, three to four inches. I'm wanting that three to four inch at that 60 degree, like uh, 60 degrees. So, yeah, you don't have to get down there a foot, nothing like that. About three inches, four inches, that's going to give you, it's going to be good to go. Because then with that depth, even though your air temperature is fluctuating, it's going to stay pretty close there unless you get, you know, some bad cold spells or something. It's going to stay pretty close. So, yeah, get down there about three inches or so. Jason's asking, when's the best time to hit your clover with clover fuel? When it comes to clover fuel, you're wanting them plants to be about three inches tall. So get them up there about three inches tall. That is a foiler fertilizer, so it's going to adhere to the plant. So the more that's there, the more it's going to adhere to. So, And a lot of people ask, well, we got an ATV or we got a tractor on a sprayer and we don't want to drive through it because it's going to tear the plot up. That's a perennial plot. If that plant's up three inches, the root system's already developed and... If it does smash it down or breaks it, whatever, it's going to grow right back. So don't worry about that one bit. And another question I have with a customer today, I actually had it with him a couple times now. Uh, the guy raises deer uh, as pets and uh, some beautiful deer. Actually, he sent me some pictures of them today, beautiful deer. And uh, and they are literally pets, you know, giving him kisses while he's feeding them. I mean, that type of pets, which is awesome. And uh, his concern was asking if our clover fuel or our plot max or our jolt would hurt deer. So, and it won't. I mean, there's there's nothing there that's going to hurt or harm a deer uh, from a, a wild deer to a pen raise here. It's not, there's nothing there that's going to hurt. Let's see what we got here, guys. No one asking about Jolt. Uh, Jolt, just like we were talking about clover fuel, Jolt is actually our fertilizer that is made for annual plants, stuff that, that needs nitrogen. So that's where you're going to go the same way, three inches or more. Uh, I recommend with the Jolt and clover fuel at least two applications a year, uh, but you'll see a big difference in the, in the plant. So uh, but the jolt is for the annuals. The clover fuel is for the perennial type plants, or actually legume plants, I should say, not perennials, but legumes, uh, your clovers, alfalfa, peas, uh, stuff like that. Sure, this is done here. I'm going to start on something else here. All right. Now, we were talking here just a little bit ago about how high priced fertilizer is right now. There's some of you out there that probably already do this. I've done it for years. Uh, and people thought I was crazy at first, so I seen what I was doing. I have certain plots that I use an annual mix in. And I have my other plots that are pretty much, which I call my food plots, uh, that are my, my clover plots, my trophy clover especially. Uh, in them annual plots that I have, I will rotate them, especially like with the honey hole. Uh, I'm planting two, possibly three years, depending on what the second year looks like. I'll plant up to three years and then I'll rotate it into a clover plot. Then I'll take a clover plot out elsewhere and turn it into a honey hole plot. 
I mix the honey hole and slam dunk together. Makes an awesome. That's my favorite mix ever uh, for a, an annual plot, all season hunt over plot all the way through the spring of the next year. But what I do with them plots in the meantime, a lot of people just let their annual plots just lay there and grow up through the summer and uh, all spring, summer long, they're growing up, nothing in them. What I like doing, especially now, even with the fertilizer being so high, I like taking clover. You know, you can spend 30, 40 bucks and go through an acre plot and plant, uh, seed some clover over into it, frost seed it over on that bare soil because them deer all have them brassicas and stuff ate down to nothing. Spread it over on top of it and let that stuff just grow through the year. And, uh, you know, that them clover plants are going to bring nitrogen in from the air and store it into the soil. Well, them annual plants that you're going to work that soil up and plant, uh, like here, first part of August, there's extra nitrogen right there that them clover, them clover plants brought in. So you're actually feeding the deer through the, the uh, late spring, early summer, and then you're, and you're feeding the soil at the same time. So it's a pretty good insurance policy there uh, when you can go in there and, and, you know, for 30 or $40, you can go in there and plant an acre clover and you're benefiting the soil, you're benefiting the deer, uh, and it's keeping the weed issues all down. So don't let them plots just lay there empty. You know, give them deer something to eat, something especially that's going to help the soil. Uh, you know, you can even get in there with, uh, let's say, cereal rye. You know, get in there with cereal rye. It's going to pull nitrogen from stored way down deep up to the surface. So, you know, that's a good product there to use. I mean, that's an awesome, especially in the fall of the year. You can't hardly beat cereal rye when it comes to a plant that, for the ones of you that don't know, cereal rye acts like a perennial for the first year. You plant it in the fall, and it, no matter how hard the deer eat it, it continues to grow. So they eat it down to the ground, it grows right back. And it will go dormant with the first heavy frost. And then in the spring, about a month before regular spring green up, that cereal rye will start growing back, and it's going to give them deer about 30% protein to feed on when they need it the most uh, early that spring through the, you know, to get through them late winter months, that spring food helps them out a lot. So especially you're giving them a high protein food source such as that, uh, you can't beat it. Let's see what we got here, guys. And I'm just rambling, so just stay with me. Get me talking about food plots, I don't shut up. All right, we have, let's see here, let me get this back down here. Do you ever fence off a small section and see how much grazing the herd is doing to your plot? Yes. What I do, I actually, I just take uh, exclusion cages. I make my own, I just a two foot circle. I just wrap the cage around, wire tie it together, and I stick a couple steel rods in the ground and slide it right over top of them. I do that in every plot that I plant, especially, especially my perennial plots because a lot of people don't realize how much a deer normally eats. And uh, our guys that were on here the other day, Kevin from Backwoods Life, they did one last year and it just blew you away. The field was bare. I mean, and it's sugar sand. It was bare. And here those big beautiful plants are up in the exclusion cage, just showing how much, how much deer pressure they actually have. And I have a property that has way too much deer pressure and I can't kill enough does off of it every year to even make a dent in it. And I've tried. Uh, and they will literally wipe out a plot. I mean, I got I got half acre clover plots that I never have to mow just because the deer will keep them mowed for me. And uh, but yeah, them exclusion cages and little fence deals you're talking about. I think everybody that plants a food plot needs to put one down. And that's the biggest tattletale sign to see how much your deer are actually eating. And it will really show you and do it early because a lot of let's say our red zone blend our peas and soybean blend. Them deer love them when they're starting to fresh, just freshly sprout and start to come up. They're green, lush, tender. And a lot of people will plant that and go back and they're like, well, it's not even growing. There's nothing here. Them deer will demolish it. And that's actually what the, the mix was that the Backwoods Lab guys had was their, their red zone. But I mean, it, it'll really make a believer out of you on what the deer are really doing to a plot. So yeah, them exclusion cages, Hands down, best one of the best little tools you can have to, to show what your deer are doing. Do 
got a guy asking what what kind of material do I use uh, to make an exclusion cage uh, or you can you buy them already made up? Well, the ones I've noticed that are pretty much already made up uh, and they're not exclusion cages, but I, if you ever look at a tomato plant cage, that's pretty much what I make, but they got too big of openings. So what I do is I just go to like our local real king and I'll buy a roll that's three foot tall of the, the half inch square rabbit wire. And I'll just, I'll cut me a piece off and make me a two foot circle, wrap it around. And I'll, I'll just take some 16 gauge mechanics wire, wire the two ends together and just get a couple little uh, like electric fence posts, the little, the little tiny round, uh, I think they're half inch uh, fence posts, take them out there, stick the cage in, just drive them right down through it. And that cage is, is just slides right over it and don't go anywhere. The wind, will, wind can't do nothing with it. So literally, I think the last ones I made, I, I made some new ones last year. I think I made 15 of them in a $11 roll of wire, I think it was. I think the little the metal post, which I reuse them, but I think they're they're normally like two bucks a piece. But yeah, that's a good title tell sign for you. No, you're welcome, Mark. It, it just says Facebook user, but I'm sorry. I didn't know who I was even talking to. I don't know why it does that, but yep, I appreciate it. All right. I just had another one up here. Better get to it before I forget. What we have here is a gentleman asking about uh, and here, the product specialist part that I deal with, the customer service, this is a very good question. It's one I get a lot. I get people in the southern states that are wanting to plant turnips, uh, such as our honey hole. Uh, yes, you can get some green, uh, get some forage off the greens. One thing you're going to notice, you hardly ever get any forage off the bulbs because the region. You know, you're wanting a region where you're going to have that cold ground temp. You're going to have that hard frost to turn that plant sweet. Uh, so I try to steer people away from something like that. There, I'm looking at more of the cereal rye, stuff like that. Uh, but to help with this question here, we actually came up with a new product this year, Southern Greens, that actually has collard greens in it as a brassica. And the collard greens don't need the cold weather. So you, there, it's going to be a perfect mix for down south, work very well. Uh, now, one thing I will tell you that I've noticed with the Southern Greens uh, with the collard greens, actually, I should say, is you take a small little tiny area, the deer will keep it ate down pretty well because they don't have to wait for that frost on it. So I'd say you're getting that half, half acre stuff like that. You're going to see a lot more unless you, I mean, it's going to depend on the deer numbers too. So, but, uh, but they will eat it as soon as it starts growing. So this depends on how big the area is, if they're going to eat it down on you or not, but it works very well, but we tested it all the way up in the northern Wisconsin and the deer devoured it up there, too. So we were trying to make it just for a southern blend only and found out. And I planned it here last year. I, I mean, deer love it everywhere. It, it performed great. But that's our new southern greens mix. Here, I see another one pop in here. I need a secretary to look this stuff up for me. Actually, I just seen this and I apologize. I didn't, I didn't answer all this question. The guy that was asking about, and again, I apologize that it says Facebook user. Uh, I don't know your name there. Uh, when he was asked about the ground temp of the barricade, he also asked about depth measure. <clears throat> I guess I did answer that. I'm sorry. I thought, I thought it said seed depth. I apologize. But yeah, three to four inches on that, that ground temp it is what you want. And Trent, I appreciate the questions on here, but anytime you just let me know. Somebody said I'm a poster child for Antler King. Good Lord. Been called a lot of things, but I don't know if I've ever been called that.
All right. With, again, with the customer service that I do, another thing I have wrote down here is I've been getting a lot of calls about deer feed. And I know this kind of goes away with the, the, the food plots. I think we've pretty much covered all that. Uh, throw some questions up there again if you want to, you got some questions. But with the deer feed, we have noticed a lot of people calling in and all people think about is protein, 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 protein. They don't think about energy food sources. They think about high protein year round, and that's the wrong thing to do. Uh, they look at our rack maker, which is 16% protein, and they want, well, I want something with 30%. You know, I want it for the winter time. Well, the deer need a high energy food source in the winter, high protein during the growing season. So you get a deer that's run down after the rut need to put some body body fat back on, get their bodies built back up so they're 100%, so then they can grow to 100% the next year. You know, you gotta pour that energy to them. So a deer can only utilize 16% protein without burning fat off its body. So that's why you're seeing a lot of our feed there with that 16% protein. Now, if you wanna bump it up, our cotton candy, or roasted bean cuisine, stuff like that, you can, you can use it solely for a higher protein in the in the earlier season, uh, our deer and elk pellets, uh, or you can uh, add it to the rack maker. So, but that's why you mostly see sixteen uh, percent with ours. You know, we don't want to go over that. We don't want to be burning fat off these deer in the winter time when we're trying to put fat on their body. And you'll see that with our blocks too, like our Graniac block, all that. Now we got a new, we got a new down and dirty block out. It's 28% protein and it's doing very well. We tested it for a while, got it out this year, put it on the market. Uh, very high protein block, something this time of year right now, it's great to be using it. Again, that sounds like a sales pitch. Hey, old Timmy Lambert made it. I just talked to you on the phone. You said he was going somewhere, but. Here's one that's Timmy Lambert that's on here, a dear friend of mine. We got a bunch of bunch of plots to put on his property this year. You'll see a lot of content coming off of it from uh, our strategies on how we want to run barricade to our annuals. Uh, he has an awesome Booner Buffet plot there uh, that we put in last year doing great. And you'll see a lot of content come off that this year, this fall anyway. And you'll also be seeing the Packer Max, the one I'm always talking about, that people think that I'm sponsored by, but I'm not. Uh, we got another one, and we got a, a kit that actually turned into an eight-footer. So we're going to be running an eight-footer behind that uh, John Deere Gator that Timmy has. So be an eight-foot Packer Max behind it. Yeah, asking if it's still free shipping. You order online from us, it's always free shipping. So... No shipping costs at all. It's always free shipping if you order from antlerking.com. Uh, Rob's on here asking, <coughs> excuse me, asking uh, what ground conditions, what can I plant near a swamp? I'm considering clover mix. Any suggestions? Depends on how swampy we're talking or how wet we're talking. But yes, you are correct. Your clovers and your chicories are going to take more abuse from moisture than anything else. Stay away from any kind of bulb plant, anything like that. Yeah, go with go with the chick like our game changer clover will work very well. Uh, you can add some chicory in it. We, you know, our chicory's in one pound packs. You can add some in there. Uh, but yeah, that'd do very well. I would definitely go with a, a clover variety uh, and a perennial variety. I wouldn't go with an annual. Go with a perennial like a game changer clover, and it'd work very well for you. Let's see what I missed here. Question about the pH kit. Yes, uh, asking if where to send it off. We do not send the pH kits off. You actually will know the pH of your soil within about 10 minutes of taking that sample. You can do it right out into the food plot. Uh, you need something that's gonna hold eight ounces of soil, eight ounces of distilled water, something to stir it with, little handheld shovel, 
uh, and then the chart and everything that's actually in it uh, will show you everything. I thought I might have one sitting right here. And I might, I do. Actually, if you, I don't know if you guys can see this or not. You got your test strips that you use. One kit will do four, four food plots. But then with the, the sheet inside, and I know you won't be able to read this or nothing, but I just kind of show you. These down here is where you actually, after you test that with them strips, you go on here and see which one you're the closest to. And it's going to tell you what your pH of your soil is. Over in here is going to tell you how much, actually over in here is going to tell you how much lime to add per acre to get it up. Say if you're at a 5.5, you want to go to 7.0, how much, how much there is. So, and on the back, what's what I talk about, I know you can't read it, but if you get one, it's going to tell you the, actually the loss of fertilizer that you have when your pH is too low. So nice little, nice little deal tells you all, has all the directions on it. Literally within 10 minutes of doing the food plot, you already got your answers. You can go buy the lime right then and put it down. So it, it's that simple. And again, one kit's actually going to do four food plots. So no worry about sending it in the whole nine yards. It'll work out very well for you. Does elevation impact food plot success, like planting on a hillside versus flat ground? Depending on, number one, it's going to depend on the way it's the way that's laid out on the amount of sun it's going to get, uh, the soil, you know. But no, I mean you can still grow good on it. The only thing I've noticed on hillsides is a lot of times you have a lot of issues uh, after planting as in getting rain, washing down to the bottom of the hill. Depends on how big the hill is, how steep it is, the pitch. Uh, I've seen a lot of germination loss that way. And uh, Jeff Johnson, good to see you. Uh, but no, I mean, it doesn't. But you definitely want that sun, you know. Depending on which way it's running, it's either going to get a lot of sun or it might not get any sun hardly at all. So sun and, and uh, the pH of the soil and, uh, and again, Mother Nature. If she treats your rights and don't give you downpours until that and lets that seed actually get the root system developed, uh, you'll be good. But man, if she wants to run all the way down to the bottom, it's nothing you can really do about it. Will your grade eight work well for a small six acre plot in the woods with decent sun exposure? It will. Uh, again, that mix will grow in a little lower pH than some, uh, but the better that pH is, the more fertilizer it's going to utilize and the bigger the, pl the plants are going to get. When it comes to something like a six acre plot, I'm telling you, but what I really like doing is find something there like, like the cereal rye. If there is cereal rye in the grade eight, so it's going to have some in it. Uh, get you a mix that's going to continue to grow you a, a perennial something like that you want something that's going to constantly have food there as they eat it down it's going to continue to grow a lot of your annuals that are in that grade eight as soon as they get up in that mature stage and they eat them down they're not growing back so uh your perennial mixes clovers alfalfa no, not alfalfas in that area but certain clovers uh chicories uh fall winter uh, or fall winter spring actually if it was me truthfully I would rather see you plant the fall, winter, spring than the grade eight in that area. Uh, number one is because of the cereal rye that's in it. Uh, you're also going to get your uh, your tubular radishes that's in the grade eight. Uh, you're going to get uh, some winter peas that are in it, the buckwheat that's in it. I mean, it's going to do very well for you. And that uh, they'll leave them turn up them radishes alone and they eat that cereal rye and it continue to grow. So. I think if it was me, I'd look more into that fall, winter, spring. But the grade eight will, to answer your question, it will do good for you. But I just like having something that's going to continue to keep growing as they eat it. Dustin Gaskill, good to see you on here, bud. Oh, what other questions am I missing here?
And again, with that fall, like with that fall, winter, spring, the cereal rye that's in it, cereal rye is a heck of a soil builder. So. Jeff, I think you misunderstood him. You said it was six acres. He said a small six acre, not six. Rick Stillman, good to see you on here, bud. Wow, oh, you guys are bouncing through here. I'm trying to see what we got here. Got any Roundup Ready products? Sorry, Robbie, I had to. And sorry, bud, I don't even know who I'm even talking to because this is a Facebook user. Uh, no, we don't have any Roundup Ready products. This year, we actually looked into them pretty hard. And the paper trail that you have to have with Roundup Ready, uh, it, it's just not feasible. And, and especially for the price. I mean, it you get into your clover, stuff like that. You know, you're, you're looking a couple hundred bucks per acre. And, and for some, I mean, I understand completely. It'd be it'd be nice to just be able to run over there and spray over top of it. But to me, it's just not feasible. It's just a, a lot of money for that. But the paper trail is the worst thing. And having to have it stored in different areas. It can't be stored with other seeds. I mean, it's pretty tough. So, again, to answer your question, no, we, we do not have any. Let me see what we got here. Jason's other talk about the fall, winter, spring. Yeah, that's that's a very good mix. You know, we've had that mix for many, many years. And let me think here. Last year is the first year we put it out we actually added the uh buckwheat and the i mean let's start off that we added the tubular radishes to it and it just made it a phenomenal mix then so and the grade eight that he's talking about that you're looking at a mix that you know our uh fall winter spring slam dunk honey hole lights out that's four of our number one uh annual mixes so what a lot of, guy, of us guys have done over the years is we've taken all four of them, mix them together and plant them. Uh, again, something not to do. Uh, it's hard to get you. I mean, you got to get them percentages just right of each seed or they compete with each other. You know, they starve each other out. Uh, so what we end up doing is taking a few years and took all four of them products and started getting the percentages just right. Finally got it to where they all grow well. Uh, they don't compete with each other. And uh, that's the grade eight. So you're getting all four of them in one bag. Yeah, Jason's on here talking about fall, winter, spring is his favorite. Yep, that's a good one, man. Not as good as my fancy trophy clover mix, though. Nothing's better than clover. Just ask me. But actually, I'm like, no, there's a... Uh, you know, clover is one of them ones that everybody needs to have a, an all-season food source on their property, especially a protein food source. And uh, so, I mean, everybody thinks I just got all clover, but I don't. You know, I, I have the annual plots. I mean, you got to have that energy food source out there for them deer. But uh, I am very passionate about clover. I'm very passionate about giving them deer all the protein food source they can have all through the, the spring, summer, uh, early fall months. And uh, then they start transition over to them energy plants. So uh, you got to have both, but definitely I tell everybody, if you can only have one food source on your property, you only got one spot for a food plot. It's definitely going to be a clover plot in my book. Uh, I got a guy asking, is Booner Buffet the only product with alfalfa in it? Uh, with us, yes. It's got two varieties of premium alfalfa. Uh, There's so many different varieties of alfalfa out there. You know, it took Todd many years of testing alfalfas. And when I mean many years, he has almost 30 years wrapped up in it. 
of testing alfalfas to get what he wanted out of it. So that's why if you look at the Booner Buffet, it needs that 7.0. It needs that neutral pH. It has to have a great, uh, the best soil. It has to have a good sun uh, because of them two varieties of alfalfa. But that alfalfa is phenomenal. I mean, it, it is the, the clover that's in it, the, the chicory that's in it, it had grown a little lower pH, but that alfalfa won't. And I think I told you guys last time, we actually had, I took half of a power line that gets great sun. And I, I mean, I knew the soil in this power line was low as like a 5.5, 5.8. I worked and worked and finally got that up to like a 6.8, 6.9 on half of it. I left the other half of that 5.8 and I planted Booner Buffet all the way through it. And the alfalfa was just beautiful. Actually, some of the commercials you'll see on our YouTube and stuff, that's actually my Booner Buffet plot on that on that commercial uh, that's so lush and thick and tall of alfalfa and clover and chicory. But if I had to turn around and took a video of the other, same way with clover and chicory, but there ain't one touch of alfalfa in it. It has to have that good pH. You've got to get that pH up for them two premium varieties to uh, to make it. Yeah, Anthony, yeah, turkeys love it, especially bugging it. They love clover. As I had a gentleman call me today, ask me what's the best thing that I use. They they love bugging through them clover plots. So yeah, that Booner Buffet is a good one too. Yeah, I have a gentleman on here ask uh, talking about the cool the cool season seeds that we use, and yes, and the trophy clover they are cool season seeds. That's why you'll see a difference in us compared to most. Uh, we use all cool season seeds, which if you don't know the difference between cool and warm, you take, take them, plant them side by side. Your warm season seeds, when that cold weather hits, you get the frost and stuff, you're going to see that plant wilt over. It's going to die off, uh, lay their dormant. Uh, where the cool season seeds, it, they, they are developed where they will actually stay green and lush. Uh, even with snow on top of it, you go kick snow off of it and it's green, you know? So that's the difference between your cool season and your warm season seeds. And they cost a lot more too. That's only a negative thing, but they're worth it. And with our, so with our trophy clover, you know, that's why it's such a premium variety of the clovers that we use in it. We have our germination coating on it and then the cool season seeds. I mean, they're, if they fired me tonight, I, I mean, trophy clover mix, I'll use it for the rest of my life. I mean, I have mixed clovers when I was younger. And you hear everybody say, don't buy deer on the bag, you know, and that might be for some. Uh, but until you get in to the testing process and see how plants actually perform when you have the percentages of each species just right, compared to going and buying a pound of each one of them, mixing them together and planting it, you'll never say that again if you ever did it. So the forage is 10 times better. I mean, it, it's the plants don't starve each other. I mean, people don't realize how much a plant will starve another plant for nutrition if you don't have it just right. So find one that works. And that's what I did with Antler King. That was the first product I ever planted with Antler King. I found it at the Illinois Deer Show and uh, the guy working the booth pulled me over and talked to me about it and I used it and I could not believe it. The difference between that, that blend compared to the stuff I was buying at our FS store by the pound and mixing myself. It just threw me for a loop. Well guys, we're rolling here to nine. Well, I guess it's eight o'clock, nine o'clock Ohio time. You got any more questions? Throw some up here. If not, we'll get ready to jump off here. I appreciate everything. And again, you know, my phone's always on, email, whatever. I'll be more than happy to help you out in any way. I think I see one lit up here. Hold on. What will kill wild onions? You know, I've never had no issue of ever killing wild onions. So I don't know if it's something that you're having an issue with or not. I got a field that gets them really bad and glyphosate kills them like crazy. So I've never had no issue with uh, killing them. I just always use 41% glyphosate 
uh, it takes pretty hot dose, but it, it will it'll do the job in my area anyway. Whoever the Facebook user is, thank you for the night. I, hey, I appreciate it. I'm glad you guys jumped on here. You know, we started this, doing this every week. Now we're kind of getting into every other week. So it's going to be every other Thursday from now on, unless a lot of people want me to get back on here every week. I just I just don't want to get everybody burnt out. You know, right now it's planting season. Everybody's working, enjoying the weather. So I'm thinking, you know, a couple times a month, this would be good to do. And uh, But if you want more than that, just let me know. Uh, and again, you know, let me know if there's some questions you have you'd like for me to talk about. You know, feel free to email me at Robbie at antlerking.com or you can go onto our website. You can actually email off of it and it comes straight to me. Call me, whatever you got to do. I'll be more than happy to talk about anything you want me to on here. And uh, we'll just go from there. But guys, I appreciate it. We'll get off here. And like I say, have any questions, let me know. And you guys have a great night. Great weekend coming up. Take care.